I, I think I'm ready to start. Um, the introduction is, is not essential. Yes, 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 yes. You could even use the microphone. Yeah, well, I guess not. I, I don't care. No, if you don't, then, then it, won't, uh, it won't make me sound so bad. <laughs> Well, good morning and welcome. Um, actually, uh, Georg deserves a little bit of the credit for this uh, talk. Last year, he suggested that uh, I should do something that's a little bit more of an intro to Gemstone and what's cool about it and why uh, people who are learning or new to small talk or unfamiliar with it ought to be interested. So I'm James Foster. I work at uh, VMware, which recently acquired Gemstone and I'm on the Gemstone engineering team. Uh, we're going to look briefly at small talk, the influence, the history, image-based development, and then in some more detail at Gemstone. So history, small talk originated in the 70s when each hardware had its own operating system. The language was tied very closely to the host environment and the tools were tied very closely. So things tended to be very tied into the uh, environment that you were working in. The characteristics of a file-based system that people are more familiar with today is that the schema and code is stored in text files, external to the system that you're working in. And there's a separate compiler that creates an executable or something that's interpreted at runtime. And the persistent data is also external to the program with tools that are external to the system as well. Now, people think that that's the way software is developed and that those are the way programming languages should work. But, uh, and, and the concept of an image is often a very difficult one for people to grasp. But I'd like to start with some analogies that may make it a bit more familiar. First, many people are familiar with a database management system where you have the schema and the code stored internally. So your schema, when you do a SQL database in Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server, your tables are defined inside the database and you have stored procedures that are inside the database. So that concept will be familiar to people. You use, but you still use external tools, but you interact with immediate feedback on the current state of the system. So when a database schema, um, again, a relational system, you get, uh, you modify the schema and it's changed immediately in your environment. Incremental changes take the system from one state to another. Another analogy is spreadsheets, that if you think of a spreadsheet, you'll have a single tool that has the data, the code, the editing, and so on, is all in one space. And when you save your spreadsheet, the modifications to your spreadsheet are saved. Interaction with the system, you get immediate feedback. So um, incremental changes take the system from one state to another. So again, when we're describing image-based development, perhaps we ought to be focusing on some things other than um, programming languages, but more on uh, these, these analogies. Another analogy is actually our computer. So a virtual computer, where the modifications are made from inside the environment, persistent state is saved when you shut down and restart. There are virtual machines where you can just hibernate and restore, where there's a complete self-contained environment. <clears throat> so Smalltalk is a programming environment analogous to these other things, not just an image, not just a language. 
Object represents the code and data. Object space, RAM, the virtual machine is the CPU, and the image is on disk. So with this environment, when you open the image, you're stepping into what I think of as a magical world, where you develop by modifying the existing environment, and new environments are created by cloning the existing one or copying it. <coughs> the environment contains all the tools, and you save your image to create a, small a snapshot. In small talk, Everything is an object. We have a simple, elegant language, powerful class libraries. But there are some limitations of the traditional small talks that uh, most of us use. First, the object space is limited. So you have to fit into RAM. The image is copied from the disk into RAM, and you're limited in the the object space is visible to only one virtual machine. So each virtual machine, each sequence of execution of the program is only one visible to one place. Sharing objects between virtual machines is difficult. So there you can file out uh, to a non-object format, binary, XML, SQL, no built-in object identity. So when you file things back in, you'll get perhaps two copies of objects that were filed out. And relationships are not necessarily restored properly. Now, there are workarounds for these things, but uh, these are some of the traditional limitations. And then when the virtual machine exits, if you haven't saved your image, then you'd lose your state. So that's a limitation. So I'd like to welcome you to the magical world of Gemstone, where object space is limited by disk, not by RAM. Object space is shared across multiple machines on, or multiple virtual machines on multiple hosts. So access uh, on a variety of places can all see the objects. And there's transactional persistence. You don't need to save your image writing it to disk. All you need to do is say, commit a transaction, and that state is preserved. So, Gemstone, is it a small talk environment? Is it an object database? It's two in one. So we have both the small talk and the database system all in one combined environment. Gemstone is a multi-user object server, and we'll be going into details on each of these. It's a programmable server object system, so uh, programming capabilities built into it. Manages a large-scale repository of objects. Supports partitioning between the application, client, and server, so you can layer your application into the multi-tiered model. Supports queries and indexes for large-scale object processing. Again, one of the things once you get into large collections is doing queries, you, doing a select or a detect on millions of elements could take time. But if we have indexes built in, it can take uh, milliseconds. Transactions and concurrency control in the object repository. So again, database semantics with full transaction capabilities. Connections to outside data sources. We'll look at some of that. Login security and account management. So many of the things that you have in traditional login environments, number of characters in the password, uh, how often do you need to change your password. So again, full user capability security. Services to manage the object repository. So again, backup, restore, manage transactions, and this sort of thing. Thank you. Comprehensive statistics, charting for tuning. So again, once you get into something um, in the server environment, you start to look at performance and wanting to be able to uh, look at performance and tuning capabilities. So we have that. 
So, scalability. Thousands of concurrent user sessions, hundreds of hosts can uh, have virtual machines on them, all connected to the same database. The object space is uh, in a terabytes in size. Count of 2 to the 40th, so about a trillion objects can uh, exist in your object space. Thousands of transactions per second. Concurrency. Multiple user sessions can be active, all looking at the same data. Each user can have multiple sessions, and uh, we can look at some of that. Um, you can connect, have two views into the database at the same time. Separate or shared namespaces per user. So, again, uh, you can have namespaces where globals are uh, for one application, for one user, for one domain, you can have these names available. For another part of it in the same database, a different user can have a different set of names that are visible to that user. So names uh, are partitioned that way. Changes to objects are committed in a transaction. So you can essentially save your image just by saying a commit transaction. But instead of taking seconds or more to write the whole thing to disk, it's just milliseconds to write only the changes that you've made to a tran log. Concurrency controls. So you can lock objects and request uh, concurrency <laughs> protection so that if you have a lock on an object, other people won't be able to modify it. User-based security. In order to log in to Gemstone, you need to provide a user ID and a password. Namespaces. So if a name is not visible, then generally people wouldn't uh, see it and uh, have access to those objects. There's system operations that are protected based on your user uh, per, uh, permissions. So only certain users are allowed to change passwords. So you can have administrative accounts. Per object read write access by users and groups. So each object, each individual object can be marked as read only for particular users or read write or not visible at all. So even if you have a reference to an object, if you try to send a message to it and you don't have read authorization to that object, that will be denied. So security is right down to the object level. Programmable, small talk, data definition, object manipulation, query facilities, concurrency management. All these things are built directly into small talk. So you don't have to use external tools. System management, backup, restore. Partitioning between the client and the server. So we have a Gemstone C interface. So the GCI provides an API to log in, manipulate objects, and send messages. This is officially the only way into Gemstone is through the C interface. But of course, um, that's not uh, the way most people want to program. There is a gem builder for Java. So there's a Java library that wraps the C code. So if you're programming in Java and want to send messages to a Gemstone database, you can uh, access the, C li the Java library and interact with it that way. But of course, what most uh, existing long-term Gemstone customers have been using is Gem Builder for Smalltalk. This is a library, <laughs> a Smalltalk library that wraps the C API and allows you to communicate, log in, send messages to objects on the Gemstone database. But it goes further than that. One of the magic capabilities in GBS is that it provides a two object space model so that you can create objects in a client small talk 
and save them on the Gemstone database. And then later on, you can replicate them back to your client Smalltalk environment. So this allows you to have rich client applications written in VisualWorks or VA Smalltalk that are capable of having the virtual database inside the local Smalltalk image. So you can send messages to objects. If the object is not in your local image, but it's on the database, it will get copied into the local environment. Transparent replication synchronization. Changes that you make in your local image will get uh, then persisted to the database and visible to others. <laughs> One of the things here is that it preserves the object identity across multiple fetches. So we have the capability of, I if you reference an object from two places and re replicate it in or reference it, it will always refer to only one object, which is a challenge in some of the traditional database mapping schemes. Often the object relational mapping schemes, when they replicate tables or rows from tables, data in from a relational database, keeping the object identity is a challenge. <coughs> Again, <coughs> limitations of traditional small talk, the image must fit in RAM, the visible object space is visible, sharing objects is difficult, and no built-in identity for multiple exports, imports, and the object state is lost when you exit the VM. So these are the traditional small talk limitations that Gemstone avoids. <coughs> the system handles caching into RAM. So again, if everything is on disk, there's a slow, it's slow to access the disk. So following what most database systems do, Gemstone caches recently used, commonly used portions of the database into RAM and shares that across the multiple VMs. So if the object that you want isn't in your local virtual machine or environment, but it's been read by another virtual machine recently, then you can access it through RAM quite quickly. The object space is shared by all connected sessions. And so the, each session gets a view of the database. But this view is as of the point where you acquired the view. So the last in a port or commit will give you a view of the database and changes that other people make to the database will not leak into your view. This is what uh, in database terminology is called repeatable reads. So each time you read data from the database, even if someone else has changed it, you will get the view that you had as of the point you started your transaction or view. If you want a new view, of course, you can do a commit or abort. Persistence is by reachability from a root object. So if you want to make an object persistent, you don't have to say save or some other thing like that as you would in a more traditional database, what you, a uh, relational database. What you do instead is simply add it to a collection or reference it from some other object. And if it's referenced from a persistent root, then when you commit, it will become persistent. When you do a commit or abort, then new objects that have been committed by other sessions will become visible. So when you commit, your changes become persistent and other sessions can see your changes when they next do a commit or abort. Indexing. Again, in uh, s traditional uh, client-based small talk, where everything is in memory, you will have fairly limited size collections, and doing a select or detect on a collection 
will be relatively efficient. In a database environment, so with Gemstone, if you have millions of objects and they're in a collection and they're on disk, um, it could be quite a bit more overhead to do uh, detect, find the one you're interested in. So what uh, Gemstone provides is an addition to Smalltalk where unordered collections such as set, bag, identity sets, and so on can be indexed. So you send a message to the collection, say, create an equality index on this field. And it will take that field and create an equality index on it, and then you have a B tree. The index maintenance is automatic. So adding or removing from the collection will automatically update the indexes. Changing an instance variable of a member of the collection will automatically update the index so that the index manipulation is just transparent. You don't have to add something in your getters and setters to say, this value's changed, so go make some updates. Now, in order to query them, there's a syntax available, though there are ways just through direct <laughs> small talk. But uh, one of the things that uh, Gemstone has added to the language is the curly brace syntax for blocks. So this is, a, this is not an executable block. This is what's called a select block. And with the curly braces and a certain structure of the expressions inside this, this is not traditional small talk, this is an explicit path accessing, you can say, I have a set, I want to select where each surname is Foster and each given name is James. And so this will use the indexes if they're available and give you a subset that matches this criteria. You can also, uh, that will give you the, all the items that match the criteria, which could be a larger collection than you really need, particularly for uh, certain user interface purposes or other things. So there's also the capability to say, select as stream. And so what this will do is give you a stream, a streamable object where you can then iterate over it and say, give me the next 10 items in the stream. And that will give you a collection of 10 items and they will be sorted. So in this case, we're indexing where each surname is greater than or equal to Foster. And with that, it will find all of them, and then the names that come after that alphabetically will be later in the list. And so you can create a scrolling list that you could display this way by using select as stream. And it doesn't have to build the entire collection at once. All it does is set up a pointer into the B tree and each time you send the message next, it traverses the B tree, pulls the next item. So there's not the actual collection behind the set, behind the stream. So this is not a positionable stream. This is just something that you can send the message next to, and it will get you the next one. So no matter how large the collection is or how many items match the criteria, it can, you know, in a millisecond, go to the right place and get you started with the next item. So something like that just gives you very quick performance capabilities. Uh, the VCR widgets, where you have first, next, last, and so on, where you can just say, give me the next group of 10. Um, in a user interface, just display a group here. So very, very efficient performance there. The transaction semantics. Database view is isolated with repeatable reads. So changes made before a commit are not shared. So if you've, again, the traditional 
example for transactions is the banking example, where you deduct some amount of money from one account and add the money to another account. Well, if you don't have transactions, then there is a point in time where you've deducted the money from one account but haven't added it to the other. And if someone got a snapshot or a view of the database at that point or made a query to total the accounts, they would be wrong. Whereas with transaction semantics, you either see all of a group of changes or none of a group of changes. And so these groups of changes are all or none. You can't see changes that other people have made. Other people can't see your changes. So again, you have a consistent, isolated view. On abort, the current view is reset to the most recent committed state, including any persistent objects for which changes were made and abandoned. So if you modify some objects and then do an abort, the modifications you've made are, law, are gone, are abandoned, and you get a view of what it was before, or if someone else has changed, you get those changes. Concurrency control is a challenge in any multi-user, particularly database environment. So Gemstone supports both optimistic and pessimistic concurrency. With optimistic concurrency, we wait until the commit is attempted to check conflicts. When the commit is requested, the system checks if any objects that you have modified have also been modified by another session that did it after your view was obtained. If there are any of these right-right conflicts, then the commit fails and the view is updated to the most recent, except for the objects that you've modified, which you could then copy off to some other place if you want, before you do the abort. Then you need to do an abort, which gets a fresh view, and then you need to decide how to proceed. But again, that's an application-dependent problem. Pessimistic is I want to make sure that there aren't going to be any conflicts. I'm afraid that there's going to be a conflict and I want to avoid it. At any time, anyone may request a write lock on an object. Once you've obtained a write lock on the object, no other session can commit a change to the locked object. So you are tied down at that point. You don't have to worry about somebody else making a change. Of course, they could have made a change in the view before you got the view. So you, after you obtain a lock, you should do an abort or commit. And then you can make changes and be confident that you will not have any commit conflicts, that you will be successful modifying this object. And an API exists to query the system. So if you are unsuccessful getting the lock, you can go ask the system, which session has it? Who is holding this lock, preventing me from getting it? And then hunt them down. Even with that, there's still going to be some conflict. So if multiple people want to add things to a collection, that might be acceptable from a logic point of view. So while you don't want two people changing the balance in a bank account at the same time, two people adding items to a collection may be completely legitimate. So if you have a customer list, and I add this customer, you add that customer, there's no logical reason why that shouldn't be allowed. So sometimes it's acceptable to have two sessions make well-defined changes to the same object at the same time, adding a new object to a set. So Gemstone provides some reduced conflict classes with well-defined semantics. Identity bag, a key value dictionary. With the key value dictionary, if I place one value in one key, you place a different value in a different key, that's not a conflict. An RCQ, multiple sessions can add items to 
a Q. And with that, they won't have a conflict, and another session can read items out of the queue. A counter, we can update a counter, and if two people increment the counter, it will get the ultimate total correct. External systems. You can write a user action in C, load it into the virtual machine, and invoke functions, pass objects, get objects back. There's a product called GemConnect that is a small talk library and a C-based user action to interface with Oracle. So that provides some capabilities. In an upcoming version of Gemstone 64, 3.0, there is going to be a pure interface to C libraries, where from small talk, you can communicate with a C library directly. User authentication, valid gemstone or database user ID and password. Configuration rules on the password. L you can limit the number of concurrent logins for a particular user. You can also require a host user ID and password. So some places are particularly uh, extensive on the security options. An alternate is to set up a specific a specified host user and have everyone use the same host user when they connect to the database. There's privileges. Do I have the right to change my own password? And you might deny this on a student or guest login, where you just have kind of a public login that uh, people can use. There's security for changing someone else's password. Security for compiling small talk code. So you might be able to run an application but not compile small talk code. That would be a legitimate security privilege that you would give to users. The authorization to perform backups, because of course that gives you access to the data. System-wide garbage collection. Access the file system. You might allow people to run your application, but you don't really want them getting read or write access to the file system, either local or on the server. Interacting with the user action, executing a shell command on the server is, of course, something you may want to provide security against that. Object security, each user can be associated with one or more groups, and so you could have a group of users, power users, administrators. Lots of 32,000 uh, security policies. Each one has an owner, groups, and owner access, group access, and world access. So again, this is somewhat similar to Unix security for files and directories. You can do a live online backup, so you don't have to take the system down to do backups. You can do restore to the database, including tran logs, so you do not lose any transactions up until the last commit, any transactions that committed. Shared memory to cache disk. Asynchronous I.O. to parallelize disk writes. Hosts can be added or removed on the fly to a running gemstone system, so if you need more uh, resources to run more sessions. You can add a host and point it to the database. It will get access to it. Monitoring and tuning. One thing that people often ask about is how does the namespaces work? When we're binding variables, compiling a method, there's block arguments, method arguments, instance variables, class variables, pool dictionaries, and of course, globals. With traditional small talk implementation, you have one system dictionary in which keys are the global names, and every, all the global lookup is done in that one place, and that's known as small talk, and that's the root for the object graph. In Gemstone, we search an ordered list of dictionaries, and this list can be passed to the compiler, so you can give, as you're compiling a method, you can specify the uh, list of globals that it's to search. Each session has a default based on the user. 
and that gives flexibility, so different methods can bind to different globals. And these methods could still be in the same class, but they could bind to different globals. Different users can share the same dictionary, so you can pass someone a dictionary that contains a list of globals and go from there. Or you can just ignore this complexity and use one dictionary and share it, which is certainly going to be easier. The root of the object graph is a collection called All Users that contains user profiles. You could get to your own user profile by saying System My User Profile. All Users with ID gives you someone else's user profile. And within each profile, there's a symbol list, which consists of symbol dictionaries, where the keys are symbols or names, and the values are any objects, generally classes, but can also be singletons or collections. So you can deploy multiple applications in one database without having conflicts. You could compile application classes without visibility to development and testing classes. You could compile third-party libraries based solely on base classes without the third-party libraries seeing your library. Or other third-party libraries, they can avoid that conflict. Um, class schema changes, I think I'm going to skip this for time. So, user interface tools, Topaz, Gem Builder for Smalltalk, it was mentioned. There's some other gem tools is available for a Faro that allows access, and then other people have uh, started building some other things, including some uh, uh, things that we've seen here yesterday uh, with uh, that. Now. Um, you've heard of LAMP, perhaps, Linux, Apache, MySQL, Perl, Python, PHP. With Glass, we have Gemstone, Linux, Apache, Seaside, Smalltalk, which again is just an acronym for uh, naming things. Or if you prefer Ada, Scribo, and uh, some of these other things. So uh, it's, it's really just a way of running Gemstone. So, Gemstone provides a no-cost license. Um, this is not open source. This is so when we talk about free, we need to identify this is free as in beer, not free as in speech, I think is the comparison that people give when they're discussing it. But uh, this is a no-cost license, available for commercial use. Um, there's not restrictions. It's not a... Um, an evaluation copy, it's not a non-commercial. This is free for commercial use. And uh, as was announced earlier, uh, we're now up to a 16 gig repository, two gig shared page cache, two CPUs, and of course, people say, does that mean, you know, I have to run it on a small machine? No, it's, it uses two CPUs, but you can have more disk, RAM, or uh, CPUs. This is just how much Gemstone will use. And of course, uh, we can use much larger systems, disk, shared page cache, CPUs, but that uh, is the paid license. There's a fully configured Linux system for VMware, so you can just download and everything's installed and runs. Just download it in VMware and then it runs. There's a native install for Mac or Linux. And then, of course, there's paid versions for, C for um, Solaris, HP, AIX, and some others. So we have a tutorial that, uh, there's many tutorials for Seaside, but uh, I have one as well at uh, this location. There's downloads and manuals available, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions now or later. So I'll take just a minute or two of... Yes. 
And I think they may want you to be handed the microphone. Interface with <coughs> currently not, although there's some work on is it LDAP or yes. Um, so no, right now what I've been describing is built in, but uh, there's upcoming things that uh, will not. I don't think we're going to be looking at Active Directory, but. Uh, some other things, perhaps, yes. If the gem dies, yes. um, then the stone recognizes that the gem has died and it removes the lock. Yes, yes. So locks are tied to a session, and if the session disappears, then uh, the stone recognizes it and frees the lock and allows other sessions to get it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why the Because otherwise with blocks, it's actually a message send, and it's pure objects, and it could be anything that understands the message value and so on. We're needing to look through the B tree structures at particular instance variables. And so, um, it's possible that, uh, that one could come up with a different scheme for doing it, but right now this is, th this is, yes. Dale? Uh, for, for glass, just, yeah, for glass, because of the poorly braced syntax for doing uh, uh, queries, you can't run something like that in Faro. That shows that it's, you know, the value of the cloud. So for, uh, for glass, there is a API that gives you the same capabilities for doing this query. Okay, good. 